The infantry cannon Wagen 91, or in English, infantry cannon vehicle 91, or short IKV-91, was a Swedish light tank developed to support the infantry and destroy tanks in a highly mobile and versatile role. The 91 stood because it was a 90mm gun, and the one signalized that it was the first 90mm gun to enter service. It was designed by Heglunds and Söder, now known as BAE Systems Heglunds. The IKV-91 was built to meet the Swedish army's needs during the Cold War, which basically means anything that can fight against the Soviets. The history of this light tank is very interesting and worth looking into. Also, this is actually the first video I'm making about a Swedish vehicle. Anyways, hello and welcome and enjoy this video. In the late 1960s, Sweden wanted to replace its aging fleet of tanks, many of which were designed before or during World War II. In addition to the main battle tank, Stridswagen 103, the Swedish military needed a more mobile vehicle to support the infantry and act as a tank destroyer. The philosophy behind the IKV-91 was similar to the one of the American M18 Hellcat. It was so that when you were in a tank and an enemy tank was coming towards you to attack, you didn't necessarily have to deal with it yourself. That was the job of the tank destroyers. But for the tank destroyers to get to you quickly enough to destroy the enemy tank, they had to be mobile and fast. Also, they would use their mobility to quickly flank enemy tanks to penetrate their weaker side armor. That's also why the IKB-91 was lightly armored and therefore more mobile. With this idea in mind, they requested ideas. 14 different designs from 3 different companies were submitted. They narrowed their choices down to 3 designs and eventually Haglund got the deal and they went to work. The first prototype of the IKV-91 was completed in December 1969, with two more following in 1970. The prototypes used the drivetrain, gearing and other components of the PBV-302 armored personnel carrier, which was also designed by Haglund. After extensive trials, Haglund was awarded a production contract in March 1972. The first pre-production vehicles were completed in 1974 and the full-scale production ran from 1975 until 1978 with a total of 212 vehicles built and put into service. Even though it was officially designated as Infantry Cadillac Vehicle, the IKV-91 was internationally classified as a light tank. They also considered offering the IKV-91 version with a 105mm gun to the sales market but in the end didn't do it. We're gonna talk about this version later. The main armament was a Bofors KV-90S 73, a 90mm L54 rifled low pressure gun which fired both high explosive and a tank at 800 meters per second to penetrate tanks and high explosive at about 600 meters per second to tear apart fathers and sons. The advantage of a low pressure gun is that it produces a lot less recoil for the tank to absorb than a conventional tank gun which therefore made it ideal for the IKV-91's lightweight design. Not to forget, the lifetime of a low-pressure gun is also a lot longer. Just like humans, if we pressure them too much, they'll die after a few weeks, but if we don't, they'll be around long enough to see two world wars. Don't believe me? Ask your boss who always expects something from you. The gun had an elevation range from plus 15 degrees to minus 10 degrees and was equipped with a few extractors to clear smoke from the barrel and to not intoxicate the crew, because a dead crew can't fight. The IKV-91 carried 59 rounds of ammunition, 16 were stowed in ready racks at the loader station, 18 to the right of the driver and the remaining 21 in the chassis behind the turret. The armament also included two 7.62mm machine guns, one mounted coaxially with the main gun and the other on a pintle mount attached to the commander's cupola, which by the way was fully rotational. 
for indirect fire and signaling, the vehicle was equipped with two 71mm Lyran flare mortars, which would provide light in the night and a set of smoke discharges, its number usually being 12. The IKV-91 was constructed from fully welded steel to make it resistant against small arms fire. The hull was divided into three main compartments, the driver station in the front left, the fighting compartment in the middle and the engine compartment at the rear. The gunner sat on the right side of the tank. He had a 10x magnified view through his side. He also had a lazy rangefinder. The commander sat right behind him. The loader was on the other side of the turret and the driver was on the front right. Looking at the armor, it was, as you probably expect, very thin. The welded front was designed to resist 50 to 20 mm armor piercing ammunition. Looking at the 360 degree protection, the IKV-91 used an interesting technique, which was that it had two layers of armor, so there was a gap in between. They used this gap to help against incoming heat ammunition because this disrupted the penetration process. All of this put its weight to about 16.5 tons. The IKV-91 was designed to perform well in Sweden's difficult terrain, including forests, lakes and snow-covered areas. It had wide tracks and a high power to weight ratio of about 20 horsepowers per ton, which gave it very good off-road mobility. The vehicle's low ground pressure allowed it to operate on soft ground like summer taiga at winter snow. It was also fully amphibious and could cross rivers and lakes with minimal preparation. That was because Sweden has many lakes and inland waterways and they had to be able to support the infantry there as well. Before entering the water, a trim vein was erected at the front to break the water waves which were coming from the front and screens were raised around air intakes and exhaust outlets so that no water can come in where it shouldn't. In the water, it was propelled by its tracks. The IKV-91 could swim at a speed of 6.5 km an hour. The vehicle was powered by a Volvo 12 liter 330 horsepower turbocharged diesel engine. Now, one of the most interesting things about the IKV-91 itself was the way the engine was placed. I haven't seen this ever before. It was placed not horizontally, not vertically, but diagonal. Like this. Now, why did they do it this way? Well, simple answer, they did it to save space. From what I know, horizontally it would have been too wide to fit in and vertically it would have been too long, so they just did this. Generally, they tried to save weight and space and make it as mobile as they could. Simple problem solving. By the way, I am not too sure about the reason why they did it, so please correct me if I made a mistake. Anyways. This engine had a maximum road speed of 65 km an hour, which is about 40 miles per hour, and an operational range of around 500 km or 310 miles. The vehicle's engine compartment was designed with a bulkhead separating it from the fighting compartment to provide better safety and protection for the crew. The IKV-91 was equipped with a clutch and brake steering system, similar to the one used in the earlier mentioned Hegelus PBV-302 armored personnel carrier. The steering clutch was a double drive plate type operated by a hydraulic servo and it also featured a torsion bar suspension with six dual rubber tired road wheels, a rear drive sprocket, bushing on the single pin tracks and a front idler. Shock absorbers were installed on the first and last broad wheel stations. This made it a quite comfortable vehicle to travel in because there was less vibration. So the crew wasn't just there like zzzz. This also decreased the noise when driving. For extremely difficult snowy conditions, they could add 50mm spikes to help with traction. Generally, it's fair to say that the IKV-91 was designed very well for the terrain of Sweden which basically consists of half-iced snow and overall a lot of difficult up and down terrain. Quite frankly, it was a defensive weapon, not an offensive one. Although people like Greta Thunberg would still get offended by it for some reason. 
Another important factor for the designing of the IKB-91 was the cold weather. That was why for the engine they had a blowtorch heater which could preheat the engine before starting it in weather conditions down to minus 35 degrees Celsius. They had a heater for the electricity as well. Talking about heating, because of the cold weather, they also added a heater system inside the vehicle for the crew. On top of that, they made the IKB-91 a bit wider than normal in order to provide more space for the crew. Because if you think about it, the crew is probably going to be wearing thick winter clothes, which requires space. The IKV-91 was well known for its advanced fire control system, which was very good for its time. It was the first tank in the world to be mass produced with an automatic and electronic fire control system. This system included a ballistic computer, laser range finder as mentioned before, and provisions for weapon stabilization. The ballistic computer automatically calculated the gun elevation and lead based on a number of different inputs such as air pressure, temperature and crosswind. The gunner manually selected the type of ammunition while the laser range finder determined the range to the target. The system adjusted the sight line using electric servo motors which allowed for fast and accurate targeting. The commander's cupola had five large vision blocks and a periscope with 10x magnification. The cupola could be rotated to align with the cannon's longitudinal axis or independently to maintain a stabilized sight line. The commander's sight could also be covered with a splinter protection shield. The fire control system allowed both the gunner and the commander to engage targets. The gunner's sight was a Jonger TP-1050L monocular periscopic sight with 10x magnification. Electric motors adjusted the aim based on the path which the computer calculated for the target. The laser range finder was capable of measuring distances from 200 to 9,990 meters. In case of a power failure, the cupola could be manually rotated and the gun could be adjusted using manual controls. What's interesting is that the gunner and the commander had a ballistic computer to input data like air temperature, propellant temperature and muzzle velocity deviations. Some data was input manually and other was brought automatically. This computer would calculate the exact way the shot had to be fired in order to hit the target. As I told you before, the IKV-91 was made to perform well in the difficult terrain and climate. That was why the Swedes decided to assign it to mostly infantry brigades but also some anti-tank brigades positioned more in the north of Sweden because it could handle its terrain well. Each of those infantry brigades would get one company of IKV-91s, which would be about 12. It was designed to provide direct fire support for infantry assaults. Besides that, it was to act in independent operations as a rapid response unit capable of surprise fire attacks. The vehicle was part of the Swedish Army's operational maneuver unit, which brought a combination of firepower and mobility. The anti-tank companies which used the IKV-91 were trained at several, several Swedish regiments, including the Skaraborg Regiment, Södermanland Regiment and Norrbotten Regiment. During 1994 and 1995, training was also conducted at the Västerbotten Regiment. For some time, anti-tank companies equipped with the IKV-91 were also part of the Södermanland Brigade, which was a mechanized brigade formed by the Södermanland Regiment. However, these companies were later replaced by tank companies equipped with Centurion tanks. In the 1980s, the Swedish military considered upgrading the IKV-91 to increase its firepower because the 90mm was seen as insufficient against new generations of Soviet tanks like the T-80, which I heard were quite feared by IKV-91 operators. Plans were made to replace the gun with a 105mm cannon or possibly a tow missile launcher. But these plans were abandoned because the turret was designed for the light, low-pressure 90mm 
and could not handle a larger caliber. If they wanted to put the plan into action, they would have had to design a completely new turret, which would be too time consuming and difficult. Despite this, Haglund independently developed a prototype in 1983 known as the IKB-91-105, which featured a Rheinmetall RH-105-11 low-recoil gun in a new turret. This version was commissioned by India, which had requirements for a vehicle which was fully amphibious and capable of firing while swimming. The IKV-91-105 had a stabilized 105mm gun, increased weight from 16.3 tons to 18 tons, and better night vision capability with an inferred system from Saab. Both the gunner and commander had monitors that allowed them to fire the main gun. This prototype could also swim faster in water, 12 km an hour instead of just 6.5. However, the vehicle did not enter serious production because India chose other options and Sweden shifted its focus to developing the CB90. In 1975, a Swedish magazine, Soldat und Technik, launched a competition to find a more striking name for the IKV-91. The winning suggestion was Järven, which translates to Wolverine in English. Despite this name being officially chosen, it was rarely used in military context, and the vehicle continued to be known primarily as the IKV-91. The IKV-91 was retired from active service in the Swedish army in the late 1990s and early 2000s, largely because of budget cuts and the introduction of newer combat vehicles like the CV-90 and the Leopard 2. Politically, the reason for its retirement was also that the Cold War had ended and the big threat of the Soviet Union wasn't really a thing anymore. And just like many militaries after the Cold War, the Swedish military went down in size. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, some units equipped with the IKV-91 were replaced by Stützwagen 102R and 104. By 2000s, all Swedish infantry brigades were disbanded and the IKV-91 was completely phased out in favor of more modern armored fighting vehicles. Anyways, that was all I had to say for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you think I said anything that is not right or you think I should have added any additional information to this video, please let me know in the comments and share your knowledge. Besides that, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.